morning. Alan bragged about not having his coat on, so I took mine off. Good to see you this morning. Good to have you here. By the way, we had plenty of people to serve this morning. We had two or three didn't even use, didn't even need, so God has blessed us plenty here. Uh, this is a special day for some people. It's not for us, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. In the Jewish calendar, there was a festival called 50, or the 50th. Sometimes it's referred to as the Festival of Weeks. It's called several different things. But really, it's called Pentecost. It's where we find its name. This is 50 days after Passover. We don't celebrate the Jewish calendar. We don't celebrate the Passover, for example. We don't celebrate Pentecost or any of the other holidays in the Jewish calendar. But it's good to remember because the Pentecost turned out to be a significant day in the uh, Christian faith as well. A significant day by God's planning and putting it together the way he did. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to spend a few minutes in the chapter in the book of Acts that tells us that on Pentecost something extraordinary happened. So we're going to look at that. You've heard of tongues of fire. You remember the tongues of fire in Acts chapter 2? This is the day that it happened. <coughs> I don't mean that uh, in Rio Rancho at this time we're going to have tongues of fire come down from heaven on us. That's not going to happen. <coughs> but in Pentecost in Jerusalem, it happened. The significance of it is enormous. And so we're going to go through the events of that day and express a little bit about what God expresses about what happened. This is when power came down from on high. Now, we can look at this a number of different ways, but I want to try and go through it fairly straightforward. So let's look at it. <clears throat> Pentecost, first of all, is a Jewish holiday, not a Christian holiday. It's really not something that we celebrate as Christians. In fact, we're not told to celebrate any holiday at all. What we are told is to do something on a regular basis, and that is to come together, assemble together, if you will, praising God, and observing the Lord's Supper. We remember him as a result of doing so. But it's a 50 days after Passover event that we're talking about this morning, and literally it's seven Sabbaths plus one. You say, why is that? Because they were always counting things from Sabbaths. And Sabbaths, of course, are seven days from each other. And we had seven of them, there's 49, plus one, that'd be 50. But it would also put it on the first day of the week every time. This is not something that happens whenever it happens on the first day of the week, and only on the first day of the week. But anyway, if we look at it from the standpoint of Sunday, uh, we, we need to recognize that Jesus did things leading up to Pentecost in setting his disciples up for what was going to happen on that day. And it was going to be big. Mark chapter 9, verse 1. He says, there are some of you standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. There are going to be some standing there alive when the kingdom of God comes. We waiting for the kingdom of God to come today? Not according to this verse. There's people that had to be alive standing there with Jesus at that time. That was 2,000 years ago. We're not waiting for the kingdom of God today. The kingdom of God has come. And it came while some of them there were still alive. It was going to come soon enough that some of them would still be alive when it happened. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. While staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. He said, you stay in Jerusalem. Wait for the promise of the Father. Which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Significant phrasing. Verses 6 and 7. When they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They didn't understand yet, did they? They had spent three and a half years with him. They had spent three and a half years learning from him, and they still didn't understand. He said, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. Now, that's important for us to remember today, too, isn't it? We have people today that decide they're going to figure out when the end of times is, when the Lord comes again. Good luck. The Lord said he did that in his own authority, and it's not for us to know. He says that right here. Verse 8, however, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem 
in all Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. You will receive power. In Mark chapter 9, verse 1, he says you had to wait for the power. Someone would be, still be alive when the power came. He now tells his own very own disciples, you go wait in Jerusalem for the power. It will happen. So, that's leading up. Once it came, this is what was going to happen. Now, this isn't a very easy thing to see on this particular screen because it's in cartoon colors. But the idea, it was going to start in Jerusalem, in that little place right here. Well, I can't see it back there, but anyway, right there. And it was going to spread all over the world, and it did. Verses 9 and 10, And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. A cloud took him out of their sight, and while they were gazing into heaven, two men stood by them in white robes. Who were these two men? That's a Jeopardy question you need to be able to answer. Who are these two men? Probably angels, aren't they? It's a description that is very convincing and very consistent with the idea that these would have been angels. And what do they say? Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? Now basically, they're going to tell them, what are you doing here? Get on with your business. But he says, this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go up into heaven. He'll come again that way. Now, by the way, are you looking up into heaven for him to come again? We don't stand out there and gaze into the skies all the time, but we expect when he comes again, it'll be in the similar fashion as he was taken up. But notice Jesus' last words. They were essentially to his apostles to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit to give them power. That was an important event, wasn't it? Significant event. Uh, I have a uh, book in my collection, or used to have a book in my collection, called The Hub of the Bible. Uh, Dr. James Bales wrote it. He eventually changed his mind on it, which is prerogative in an author to do, I guess. But what he basically said is everything prior to it came true at this point. Everything after that was a result of that happening at that point. And in his mind, the hub of the Bible was Pentecost, the beginning of the church. I don't know whether he's right or wrong, whether it should have been the cross that it should have been or the resurrection it should have been, but I understand why he might have chosen Pentecost as well. They received power from the Holy Spirit that day, and that was a big deal. So in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, very simply it says, you will receive power. All right, they were to be his witnesses then. Uh, by the way, when did this occur? Scripture says it was 40 days after his death and resurrection, after his death, which would have made it 10 days before Pentecost, wouldn't it? That this would have been, he would have been speaking to his disciples 40 days after he died. That's when he ascended into heaven. Why didn't he just wait until Pentecost to ascend into heaven? Well, first of all, that's an unanswerable question. But second of all, he had no reason to wait to live. He had done what needed to be done, and he had told them to wait until they received it. So they went into town and waited to receive it. All right, we have him ascending into heaven. We have the day of Pentecost beginning, Acts chapter 2. So turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2 if you want to. And if you don't, look at the screen because we've got it up there. I, uh, I didn't do it because you were lazy. I did it because I was lazy. I didn't want to read out of the book all the time. But it says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. The word Pentecost means what? Literally, it means 50th. 50th day after the Passover, after the Pascha. So what they had was a group in one place. They are together in the upper room aren't they? Suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Now, I don't know how big this house was, but it says that there were 120 of them in that room. That's a pretty good sized room, I would think, wouldn't you? Divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So we have an event occurring. Tongues of fire. Now, are they literally fire flickering above their heads? That's the way the artist depicted. That's the way often people believe it happened. But it's as tongues of fire. What is the word as? You guys remember your grammar from when you were in English classes? Oh, you don't, do you? We, we should. As and like mean what? This is exactly what happened, right? No, as and like means this is like what happened. It's similar to what happened, 
it's not really what happened. So again, here's a thought where people overemphasize what it says about flames of fire. They say, no, the Holy Spirit descended on them, but it was like flames of fire. It was as flames of fire, not actual flames of fire. But that caused them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, by the way, how do you know you're filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, I don't know. They had some knowledge of it, though. And this is the way they describe it. They began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The word tongue here is glosseus. You may have heard that used in some of the discussions of uh, Charismatics and Pentecostals who argue that we should speak in tongues if we're Christian. Uh, they missed the point terribly because glosseus just means language. That's all it really means. However, it goes on in this very passage and talks about dialect, which is a much more specific word than tongue or language. We'll come to that in a minute. How did they know they were filled with the Holy Spirit? Because they began to speak in other tongues. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Now is that a hyperbole? Possibly. But it's good enough for our purposes, isn't it? There were lots and lots of Jews there from lots and lots of different places. And at the sound, the multitude came together. The sound was enough that the whole city heard it and began to congregate around them. They were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. This is language. This is not glosses. This is not tongue. This is language. It's going to get even more specific in just a moment. Each heard the message in his own language that he had been born in, actually, is what it's going to say. And this is a lot more specific than just in his own language, isn't it? By the way, the word that you, you know, language that you're born in is language in which you are actually dialectically speaking. Any Okies in here? Come on, you're proud of it. Raise your hand. Of course you are. They, they speak a dialect, don't they? Any Texas in here? Yeah? You speak a dialect, don't you? You don't speak English. You speak something close, but it's not quite English. Yeah. Redneck. Redneck. Okay, there we go. There's the dialect they speak. Uh, I came from California. When I went to uh, school in Dallas, Texas, they all laughed at me because of my dialect, the tongue that I was speaking in. I said, I'm not speaking in tongue. I'm speaking in English. What are you guys speaking? And it was a good question, by the way. Uh, they came from all over, too, so it was funny. All right. Dialectos. Dialect. We know that word. We use that word. It comes from the Greek, and it is used here in Acts chapter 2. And it's much more specific than just language. By the way, people say, well, they heard 17 different languages spoken. No, they didn't. They, had, they heard innumerable languages spoken, all of them specific enough to be the dialect that they were born in. Amazing thing that happened. Power was being demonstrated, wasn't it? How is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? How is it, they asked, that we hear in our own native language? Some have argued that the power and the miracle that accomplished was not their speaking these languages, but rather the hearing that the audience heard. And that's what the miracle was. Well, I'm not going to argue that one way or the other. I don't think that's what happened. I think that rather it was a more fluid crowd setting where these guys were walking through the crowd and they would turn to a Persian over here and speak to him in his dialect. And then over here, there'd be a Parthian. They'd speak to him in his dialect. And maybe there'd be somebody over here from Nubia, and he'd be spoken to in his dialect. And maybe it was a little more fluid than that. I don't know. Whatever it was, it was power being demonstrated, wasn't it? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamians, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, Visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. We all hear in our own language the mighty works of God being proclaimed. Wow, that was quite a powerful demonstration, wasn't it? Now, basically, I put the same thing up, but instead of the arrows going out, think of them as having come in. Why were they there? They had come in for the Passover celebration. Under the Jewish law, a male was supposed to come to the temple three times a year and celebrate and worship God. That generally was for bringing sacrifices to the temple at that point. But even when they were scattered, and they were scattered by the Assyrians in about 725 BC, 
in which they were scattered throughout the Assyrian Empire, meaning they put uh, Israelites in uh, Turkey, in uh, Iran, all over the world anyway. These guys now were coming back to Jerusalem to worship at Passover. But this wasn't Passover. This is Pentecost 50 days later. Well, you know, they couldn't get plane flights out of Tel Aviv very easily that year. Uh, so they stuck around a little longer. No, they were traveling on foot, hundreds and even thousands of miles in some cases, to get to Jerusalem. It would be no bother to wait another couple of months to go to Pentecost before they go home. The three celebration feasts were Passover, Pentecost, and then there was one in the fall, which was the Harvest Fellowship. So they could stay there for those two, Passover and Pentecost, and then leave, and that's basically what they were doing. All that were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? And then, of course, there were those who said, oh, they're just drunk. They're, they're, in, they're in their cups. They uh, drank some new wine. By the way, the discussion we have today about whether it's new wine or old wine, uh, come on now. The guys thought they were drunk with the new wine. Maybe we've got it all backwards. I don't know. But the idea is they thought they were just drunk. Now, I don't know how a drunk guy can speak in the language that he doesn't know to someone who does know it and was born in it and have him understand it. Uh, maybe you guys can explain that to me. Maybe I just didn't do enough drinking when I was younger. I don't know. But I don't see how that would work. That was what they said. These guys are just drunk. Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed the men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. Let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the morning. Now, uh, I do know enough about drinkers to know that that's not an argument that holds a whole lot of water. If you're an alcoholic, you'll drink at any time of the day. But his purpose here is to express that they're not just drunk. This is the first, this beginning of the day. You think of this, you think of a guy getting drunk, you think of the end of the day, don't you? Not the beginning of the day. So it's a legitimate argument to make at this point. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. We're going to spend a moment on this. King James says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. This, meaning what's happening right here, near demonstrative pronoun, is, that's the state of being, the equal sign, so to speak, in an equation thing. This is that, which is a far demonstrative pronoun. This is what Joel spoke about. When Joel spoke then, he was talking about this right now. Now, how do we know when the Holy Spirit's uh, prophecies are being fulfilled? There's one very strong principle we need to follow. When the Holy Spirit interprets the Holy Spirit, we need to accept that that's the interpretation he intended. This is what he meant when he wrote in Joel. Now, when did he write in Joel? 500 years before. Does that matter that it was 500 years before it came true? No. What matters is he says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Well, let's take a look at this prophecy, okay? In the last days, are we in the last days, by the way? Nod your head yes or no. In the, yeah, we are. John says we're in the last days. Joel said in the last days. Peter said this is that. That means this is the last days. Pentecost was in the last days. The last days began on Pentecost, I think we could say. In the last days, it shall be, God declared, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. The Holy Spirit came upon them on Pentecost, didn't he? They were baptized with the Holy Spirit. He's referring here to a baptism of the Holy Spirit. He's now interpreting himself, saying, that's what I meant when I spoke about it four or five hundred years ago. I was referring to this event this morning, Peter says. As your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. The all flesh, though, is a reference to Gentiles. I'll pour forth my spirit on all flesh. So you're going to pour forth the spirit on uh, chimpanzees, dogs, cats, fish? No. Well, what does he mean by all flesh? Jewish flesh and Gentile flesh. That's what he meant. How do I know that? Well, that's because the Holy Spirit's interpreting himself, and he's going to show that. 
And as he goes on through, he actually goes with Peter to another location where Peter is called by God to preach the gospel to all flesh. And that's the household of Cornelius. You remember in that particular incident, Peter had to be shown, and God showed him a vision, the net, the sheet uh, ro- lowered down with all kinds of animals on it. He says, kill and eat. And Peter said, no, no unclean has ever crossed my lips, and none will. And God says, what God has made clean, do not count as unclean. Who did the Jews consider unclean? Gentiles. This was going to be the case. In fact, he brought Jewish brethren with him so that when the Holy Spirit came down on Cornelius and his household and they began to speak in tongues also, Peter turns to the Jewish brethren that were with him and he says, anybody here want to forbid them baptism? Seeing as how God has accepted them. Very important thing, the all flesh thing there. Chapter 2, verse 19. I will show wonders in the heavens above, signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. Wow. It will come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. That's Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. What's his accusation here? The hands of lawless men were the Romans, right? Uh, Not just the Romans. The hands were also bloodied from the high priest on down. God raised him up, however, loosening him from the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also may dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades and let your Holy One see corruption. By the way, what is the word Hades? What does it mean? Give you three guesses. The first two don't count. What is it? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. The grave, yeah. Typically people say, well, that's hell. No. In fact, in this passage, often the King James said hell instead of Hades. It's Hades. It's a grave. Uh, you're not going to let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. All right, so what? Well, that's a problem, wasn't it? David, being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ. That he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up. And of that we are all witnesses. By the way, what witnesses is he talking about? He's talking about himself, his other apostles, other Christians who had seen him. Paul, through the Holy Spirit, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, actually designates there were 500 who saw him all at the same time. There were numerous witnesses after he was resurrected, just during that 40 days that he was here on the earth before he ascended into heaven. God raised him up of that were witness, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God. How many times does he say that he's at the right hand of God in the New Testament? Over and over again. Having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. This is what God said. David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David said, My descendant is going to say this. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now before we go any further, I've got to ask you something. When you preach a gospel sermon, and it is actually specifically the gospel, not about the gospel, not about the church, not about things that God has done, but the gospel itself. What is the gospel message? This is the first one right here. What is he talking about? He's talking about Jesus, isn't he? What is the good news? Jesus is the good news. God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. That's an accusation, isn't it? Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? King James actually says, what shall we do to be saved? But that's an implied part of it, not actual. 
He says, what can one do when one has crucified the Son of God? A little formal in the English, perhaps, but we understand it. What can one do? I mean, we crucified the Son of God. It's like a rhetorical question. What can we do? The implied answer is nothing, right? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He gave him an answer, didn't he? Wow. Now that's pretty intriguing in itself. They had no hope, but he gave them an answer. The Holy Spirit answered them and says, yes, there is something you can do. Repent and be baptized. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Who is the far off? That's another reference to, don't all say it at once now, the Gentiles, obviously, yes. With many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added to that day about 3,000 souls. Wow. Wouldn't it be neat to see 3,000 people baptized in one day? <laughs> there have been some theologians have argued that they didn't have enough water in the area to do this. I don't think that was a problem, do you? The Lord would have provided somehow, wouldn't he? fact is, we forget there were lots of pools around the city of Jerusalem. Pool of Bethesda, uh, Bethesda, uh, Siloam. Uh, there's a brook Kidron running down the valley outside there. There's a Jordan River just over the ridge. They had plenty of water accessible to them at that point. There were about 3,000 baptized that day. What they do after they were baptized? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Breaking of bread is often interpreted as a taking of the Lord's Supper. Day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous heart. They met in the temple daily. They weren't illegal at this point. Although the Jewish leadership didn't like them, had killed their master, had put everybody on notice they might kill them too, and in fact did very shortly after this, but initially they were able to meet in the temple. They praised God, had favor with all the people. The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. It's a very simple story, but a story filled with power. And there were tongues of fire that came down from heaven. And power came from on high. And the church was born. This is the beginning of the Lord's church. When power came down from on high. This is why we're here this morning. Not because today is Pentecost, but because today is Sunday. This is the Lord's church meeting together. So on that basis, let us consider our responsibilities, our history, our relationship with the Lord. A relationship that came from the Holy Spirit coming down to his disciples at that time, almost 2,000 years ago. Right now, we're going to offer an invitation. It is for repentance. It is for forgiveness of sins. If you need to be baptized for forgiveness of sins, and you need to come now just as they did when they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? So at this time, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?